All right, you guys, who is ready to learn more about Wine Ambassador and building our businesses? I've got Nell Galinsky here today to lead us in that. You all watch the amazing show on Wednesday night of the Wine and Dine. Oh, all those recipes were so yummy. Um, Nell, great job on hosting on Wednesday. Thank and you. I, know I took notes and ideas on all those recipes. What, do you, what are you gonna teach us today? Well, actually, um, I did some research on uh, some history on prohibition and wine. So um, I've got some interesting details. So I did a PowerPoint presentation or not a uh, not a PowerPoint uh, Canva presentation. So uh, if I can find it, um, I'll share my screen if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> All right. Will you go ahead and find it and see uh, I have it pulled up here somewhere I did all right there you did it wonderful right there, right there it is okay whoops at the very end hold on a minute that was that an was... amazing presentation <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the very end of it hold on a minute I gotta go back to the beginning Ask me if I'm nervous. <laughs> oh, you're fine. It's just you and me here. Okay. All right. Here we go. Um, I've heard Roy speak about prohibition and how it um, affected the wine industry over the years. So I decided to do a little bit of um, um, research on prohibition and find out exactly um, how much it did cost the wine industry. So here we go. Um, Prohibition set the California wine in industry back decades. Most wineries never recovered, and there was a devastating loss of expertise as winemakers moved on to other professions. When uh, pro Prohibition began in 1920, there were 713 bonded California wineries. By 1933, the vast majority of those were out of business. Some wineries uh, that closed due to prohibition were simply left abandoned for decades. These empty buildings became known as ghost wineries, and fortunately, many have never uh, have since reopened. Um, Prohibition was a period of nearly 14 years of U.S. history, from 1920 to 1933. This is when the manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquor was made illegal. It was a time characterized by speakeasies, glamour, and gangsters, and a period of time in which even the average citizen broke the law. Interestingly, prohibition, sometimes referred to as the noble experiment, led to the first and only, only time an amendment to the US Constitution was repealed. This period began with the passage of the 18th Amendment to the US Constitution and was the culmination of de decades of temperance movements. However, the era of prohibition was not to last very long for the 18th Amendment was repealed 13 years later with the passage of the 21st Amendment. After the American Revolution, drinking was on the rise. To combat this, a number of societies were organized as part of a new temperance movement, which attempted to, to dissuade people from becoming intoxicated. At first, these organizations pushed modern, modern, moderation, but after several decades, the movement's focus changed to complete prohibition of alcohol consumption. The temperance movement blamed alcohol for many of society's problems, especially crime and murder. Saloons, a social haven for men who lived in the still untamed West, were viewed by many, especially women, as a place of debauchery and evil. Prohibition members, uh, prohibition members of the temperance movement claimed would stop husbands from spending all the family income on alcohol and prevent accidents in the workplace caused by workers who drank during lunch. Although prohibition itself lasted only 13 years, its origins can be traced all the way back to the temperance movement of the early 1800s. Many early advocates of temperance were Protestants who believe alcohol was destroying public health and morality. The first temperance movements began advocating abstinence from alcohol in the 1830s. One of the most influential dry groups is the American Temperance Society. 
1847, members of Maine's Total Abstinence Society uh, convinced the state government to um, pass the 15-gallon law, the first prohibition law. The legislation banned the sale of alcohol in, an, in amounts smaller than 15 gallons, effectively limiting access to alcohol to the wealthy. 1851, Maine passes the Maine law, banning the production of, and sale of alcohol. The law includes an exception for medicinal purpose or medic, medicinal uses. Um, this gets interesting later on. <laughs> um, by 1855, 12 other states have joined Maine in banning uh, the production and sale of alcoholic beverages. Uh, political tension began to grow between the dry and the wet states. 1869, the National Prohibition Party is founded. In addition to temperance, the group promotes a variety of social reforms popular with progressives of the 19th century. In 1873, the Women's uh, Christian Temperance Union is founded. The group argues that banning alcohol will help reduce spousal abuse and other domestic problems. Later, the WCTU will focus on other social issues, including public health and prostitution, and will work to promote women's suffrage. By 1881, Kansas becomes the first U.S. state to make prohibition part of its state constitution. Activists try to enforce the law using a number of different techniques. The most peaceful demonstrate outside saloons. Others attempt to interfere with business and destroy bottles of liquor. In 1893, the Anti-Saloon League is formed in Oberlin, Ohio. <laughs> Within two years, the group becomes an influential national organization lobbying for prohibition. Today, the group survives as the American Council on Alcohol Problems. All right, how close is Oberlin, Ohio to you? Oh, uh, it's not that far. <laughs> And there's a, there's a college in Oberlin too. I, I don't know. I didn't really have time to, to check out to see if uh, the college has anything to do with that or not, but that's something um, that I'm going to look into. Um, December 18, 1917, the U.S. Senate passes the Volstead Act, one of the first significant steps toward the passage of the 18th Amendment. The law, also known as the National Prohibition Act, uh, prohibits intoxicating beverages, uh, any drink containing more than 0.5% alcohol. Okay, January 16, 1919, the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is ratified by 36 states, although the amendment bans the production, transportation, and sale of alcohol beverages, it does not actually outlaw their consumption. At the beginning of the 20th century, there were temperance organizations in nearly every state. By 1916, over half the US states already had statutes that prohibited alcohol. In 1919, the 18th Amendment to the US Constitution, which prohibited the sale and manufacture of alcohol was ratified. It went into effect January 16, 1920, beginning the era known as prohibition. Um, on October 28, 1919, the U.S. Congress uh, passes the Volstead Act and, establish, uh, and establishes guidelines for the enforcement of prohibition. The law goes into effect January 17, 1920. The Volstead Act, while it was the 18th Amendment that um, actually established pro prohibition, it was the Volstead Act that clarified the law. The Volstead Act stated that beer, wine, or other intoxicating malt or Viennese liquors meant any beverage that was more than 0.5% alcohol by volume. The act also stated that owning any item designed to manufacture alcohol was illegal, and it set specific fines and jail sentences for violating pro uh, prohibition. In one of the articles that I read, um, they put a 68-year-old uh, grandma in jail for making wine. <laughs> she was in prison for a year for making wine. Um, in addition to the 18th Amendment, the National Prohibition Act, the Volstead Act, provided the public with information necessary to understand changes to the law. Through this act, certain exceptions were permitted for research, fuel, and industries that required alcohol in their operations, as well as its use in medicine and religious ceremonies. Many wineries were forced to sell or destroy their stock before prohibition was implemented, and to assure they followed the law, some vineyards were even uprooted. 
A handful of California wineries with permits were still allowed to remain open for the production of sacramental wine. Grapes were also available to people that wanted to make wine at home, up to 200 gallons each year per household. Ben, a Zinfandel and Alicante Boucher were very popular uh, varieties at the time and can account for some old vine uh, vineyards that still exist. I'm not sure I pronounced that right. Um, with the passage of prohibition, a large black market develops around the country. The darker side includes gangs of bootleggers led by figures such as Al Capone, the boss of an organiz organized crime syndicate in Chicago. Now, there were loopholes, however, and several loopholes for people to legally drink during pro prohibition. For instance, the 18th Amendment did not mention the actual drinking of liquor. Also, since prohibition went into effect a full year after the 18th, Amendment, uh, 18th Amendment's ratification, many people bought cases of then legal alcohol and stored them for personal use. The Volstead Act allowed alcohol consumption if it was prescribed by a doctor. Needless to say, large numbers of new prescriptions were written for alcohol. Um, there were some wineries that secretly continued to produce and sell wine in violation of the law. While not as notorious as the liquor bootleggers of the day, they did work on a system of code words to con uh, conduct transactions. As time passed, so grew a lax societal attitude for the law. Speakeasies provided people with a place to consume alcohol outside of their homes. Gangsters and speakeasies. This is my favorite part. I love movies about these gangsters and the speakeasies and, and all that stuff. Um, for people who didn't buy cases of alcohol in advance or know a good doctor, um, there were illegal ways to drink during prohibition. A new breed of gangster arose during this period. These people took notice of the amazingly high level of demand for alcohol within the society and the extremely limited avenues of supply to the average citizen. Within this imbalance of supply and demand, gangsters saw a profit. Al Capone in Chicago is one of the most famous gangsters of this time uh, period. Uh, these gangsters would hire men to smuggle in rum from the Caribbean, rum runners, or hijack whiskey from Canada and bring it into the U.S. Others would buy large quantities of liquor made in homemade stills. The gangsters would then open up secret bars, speakeasies, for people to come in, drink, and socialize. During this period, newly hired prohibition agents were responsible for raiding speakeasies, finding stills, and arresting gangsters. But many of these agents were underqualified and underpaid, leading to a high rate of bribery. Um, during prohibition, uh, Agent Elliot Ness uh, begins in earnest to tackle violators of prohibition, including Al Capone's gang in Chicago. It is a difficult task. Capone will eventually or will ultimately be arrested and prosecuted for tax evasion in 1931. They never did get him for the for the um, bootlegging. Almost immediately after the ratification of the 18th Amendment, organizations formed to repeal it. As the perfect world promised by the temperance movement uh, failed to materialize, more people joined to fight uh, to bring back liquor. The anti-prohibition movement gained strength and as the 1920s progressed, often stating that the question of alcohol consumption was a local issue and not something that should be in the Constitution. Additionally, the stock market crash in 1929 and the beginning of the Great Depression started changing people's opinion. People needed jobs, the government needed money, making alcohol legal again would open up many new jobs for citizens and additional sales tax for the government. August 11, 1932, Herbert Hoover, Herbert Hoover gives an acceptance speech for the Republican presidential nomination in which he discusses the ills of prohibition and the need for it then. March 23, 1933, newly elected President Franklin D. Roosevelt signs the Cullen Harrison Act, which legalizes the manufacture and sale of certain alcoholic products. Support for uh, prohibition continues to wane and many call for its removal. February 20, 1933, the U.S. Congress proposes an amendment to the Constitution that would end prohibition. December 5, 1933, 
prohibition is officially repealed by the passage of the 21st Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Um, the 21st Amendment repealed the 18th Amendment, making alcohol once again legal. This was the first and only time in U.S. history that an amendment has been repealed. After the repeal, uh, prohibition caused a significant setback to the wine industry in California. Immediately following its repeal, larger wineries ramped up production to flood the market with a glut of wines that valued quantity over quality. In the meantime, individual states were given complete control over their own alcohol laws, with many opting to remain dry until much later. Some counties and municipalities are still dry to this day. The 1960s and 70s brought about a wine renaissance that established California producers as serious contenders on the international stage. Today, each state has the ability to regulate the distribution of alcohol and interstate commerce makes it easier than ever to enjoy great wines around the country. In fact, there are now wineries located in all 50 states. Now you know the story behind prohibition, raise a glass to the drink that made it all worthwhile. Here's to wine. Now I do have some, uh, some facts. Um, California is America's number one wine state. I think we all knew that. And the fourth largest producer of wine in the world. California makes a significant contribution to the nation and all 50 states for, by providing quality jobs, bolstering economies through hospitality, tax, hospitality taxes, and tourism. Um, here are just some, uh, some facts that um, this is just on the California uh, effect on U.S. economy. It generates $114 billion in annual economic activity, employs 786,000 Americans, gives $249 million in annual charitable contributions and pays over $15 billion in taxes annually. And wine consumption for the last 10 years. Um, in 2012, um, the total wine per resident was 2.78 gallons. And in 2021, it's 3.18 gallons. So um, it, it increases year over year, so uh, it's not going away. Um, thank you. For more information about our amazing Wine Discovery Club, get back to the person who invited you today and be sure to ask them about our three and free program. Free wine's always better. And that's my story. I love it. You know, prohibition is definitely, I mean, it, it seems, oh, it's, you know, that was a hundred years ago. That's kind of mm -hmm. weird to say, but because of prohibition, my great grandmother was able to keep the family farm going after my great grandfather was killed in a farming accident. Mm -hmm. She ran moonshine out of the basement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of um, um, families were able to maintain during the uh, depression by making moonshine. <laughs> yes, yep. So, but it's, it's neat that they allowed it for religious purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It also explains how the vineyards were able to recoup now, but we missed all those generations of people having their own mm -hmm. Right. You know, because so many of us, you know, well, my mom made rhubarb wine and dandelion wine. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we and, have a we have a friend that used to make um, dandelion wine, and and uh, he would make um, blackberry wine. Um, they were all really good, but very sweet, and they were all yeah, very very sweet. Lots of sugar in it, um, but yeah, they were they were uh, good. But the the moonshine that. Um, that was made back in the um, 20s and 30s. That was really strong stuff, white lightning. <laughs> and I think it's still made today because my son has brought jars home. Down in Tennessee. Well, yeah. in Kentucky too. Oh, uh, well, no, and you're right, Gatlinburg's in Tennessee. Yeah, we go down there and that's where we usually get, um, get moonshine. Yeah, they have tasting places there, Ooh, bad news. <laughs> yeah <laughs> this is phenomenal now thank you oh thank you 
information. Yeah. Now, um, how would we be able to utilize some of that, some of those details that you were able to give us? How could we turn that into um, marketing for our wine club? Oh, geez. Um, well, I was, uh, I haven't done a page on it yet. I was going to write a page and use some of those, um, some of those details, not, certainly not all of them, because that was like 20 pages, but, oh. um, but some of those. And um, actually, when you, when you research prohibition in, uh, you know, on the internet, you find so many interesting stories, like the one about the grandma. I mean, they, they arrested a grandma, 68 years old, and put her in jail for a year. <laughs> for trying you know because she was making uh wine at home but she was trying to support her family and um I, that was just amazing to me that they would do that but yeah to break the law yeah so. that's cool i mean i know my oldest son in alabama i mean that's how nascar started you guys was moonshine runners through the mountains oh yeah there was a movie about that yes there is mm -hmm. and um you know, I, I've been on some of those roads and yeah, no, I won't be driving them myself. I'll be in a vehicle. I might, maybe I'll walk. I might yeah. walk. <laughs> well, you know, something interesting about um, Al Capone um, in this presentation, it just mentioned him or Al Capone and Elliot Ness. Um, when we lived up in Cleveland, there's a restaurant up there that um, we went to. It, it's an older of course, it's an older building, but there were um, uh, some holes in the booth that we were sitting in, and uh, I just thought they were probably defects in the wood or something like that. Really didn't think anything about it, but part of the waitress's spiel is to tell you why those holes are in the, bo uh, the booth, and um, it just so happened that we were sitting in Elliot Ness's um, booth at that restaurant, and those holes were bullet holes from... <laughs> <laughs> when someone had come in, somebody, I forget now the whole story, but anyway, the bullet holes were from somebody coming in and trying to take him out. Wow. So you could ease, uh, yeah, this, this could be fun, but I, where I could see marketing this, you know, just on the history of it. Now we can appreciate what all the different vineyards and wineries do for us to maintain the quality of the label of you know all the different wine varieties that we hear spe specifically for wine ambassador but the entire region of california that are trying to keep the the integrity uh, the integrity thank you the integrity of the winemaking the way it's you know it's been for for thousands of years right we missed out on a couple generations and it flowed down to some of us younger ones um, because our parents had that mindset or, you know, because their grandparents went through it or whatever. Um, but we really need to take a step and, and appreciate all that the state of California in the wine region is doing because I mean, fifteen billion dollars—that number stuck out at me. That they pay that many taxes. Mm -hmm. How much more would I have to pay if they didn't pay that? Right. Yeah. And the number of jobs too—seven hundred eighty-six thousand jobs. That's that's amazing. Um, I always wanted to be a wine rep. That was that would have been my dream job. <laughs> so so um, this is the closest I've ever gotten to it. So oh, there's, there's actually a lot of different pages. Nell, you, you, you've just given everybody some new material to write more wine pages. Mm -hmm. Don't ever think that one page or one thing to market for Wine Ambassador. Um, you know, I did that quick little thing on Thursday night of the Rickard Merlot. Mm -hmm. Um. I'm getting activity, like a lot of activity, just for that one single picture of that bottle. Wow. We did that for every single label. Oh yeah, my photo booth is staying up for a while. <laughs> because I can tie, you know, the Rickard Merlot and 
prohibition and to Al Capone, because I honestly think the Rickard Merlot is an Al Capone elegant, mm -hmm. bold kind of wine that he would have enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just had I just had a thought. If you could, if you had a picture of like a machine gun and that wine bottle and maybe some um, um, pearls, that would be an excellent name. I do have an AR-15 in the house. <laughs> I have military kids. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> I don't think I can get my hands on a Tommy gun. I, it would be fun. Joel, do you have a Tommy gun? <laughs> <Dang>. <laughs> Um, all right, so do you want to take a couple of questions about this now? Sure. All right, because we're, we're running ahead of schedule here, so go ahead. I, I know. When I, when I went through that, it took me 35 minutes, but when I did it this time, it didn't take 35 minutes. I get nervous. I talk fast. <laughs> You're good. No, it was great information. Go ahead, Joel. Um, I, lo I love watching movies based on real-life events, so I was just wondering what the name of that movie was you are talking about. The NASCAR movie. Oh. I'm go Google it. I should know it. <laughs> but uh, now you did a great job. I mean, I mean, I, I love getting all this information. I mean, it's definitely stuff we can use on our pages for mm -hmm. sure um, to just kind of add to it. So mm -hmm. that's great. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank Moving you. The finish line was one. Um, Red Dirt Rising. Okay. I think it's Red Dirt Rising. I suppose, I, suppose I, I could Google too, but I just wanted to talk, so. <laughs> but, <laughs> but thank you. Canada in the house. <laughs> thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> Perfect. Things like this. All right. All right, and Tony? Hi. Uh, I love being able to say to people, in fact, I did this once during a, a church dinner, that my grandma was in a mob. She actually had a speakeasy. And when I was a teenager, here this little four foot two lady, sweetest lady you ever saw, took me around to 17th Street in Bakersfield and pointed out her speakeasy. <laughs> and the thought that I had when we were talking about this is that when people see something is happening that is wrong, just totally wrong, they do something about it. We've got the great tea controversy in the 200s or whatever. We've got the uh, prohibition. There's other things we could probably bring out, but I think what it proves is that we as a country and as its people aren't going to let stupid things happen for long. <laughs> True. We just yeah. have to go through it. You know, we have to, we have to trudge through it. But I just, I never forget grandma, you know, saying, really? and this is the speakeasy, dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that picture. <laughs> the speakeasy aspect, um, growing up in, in Minnesota, we knew about the St. Paul Caves. And that's where, you know, Fred and Ma Barker and, and John Dillinger, I had to pull it up to remember the names. But the caves of St. Paul acted as a speakeasy for the gangsters and they would all come in from Chicago and such. And the, uh, it says here, St. Paul police chief John O'Connor pledged protection if they kept their crimes out of the city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that worked for a little while. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Kathy Taylor. Thank you. No, that was just, Incredible. Thank you for all of the information. And Stacy, I just wanted to say about what you just said. I think that they also have some of those caves in Stillwater, yes, Minnesota. And um, I, I popped, I used to live in Minnesota and I popped down there and went through that tour. It's pretty interesting. 
But um, I didn't really have a question. I just, something really popped out um, of your presentation when you said that after prohibition, when they were starting to um, manufacture these liquors again, that they started making these wines in mass production. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now we have the juices, the, the, what does Rory call it? The juice? Kool-Aid punch. Punch. Kool punch. Kool Kool punch. That's where the Kool-Aid punch started. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because I guess they were in just such a hurry to get wine out to the people that um, we lost some of that quality of just letting it really steep and sit and simmer and cook. And um, I thought that was really interesting that that was probably where that started was right. you know, very, very interesting. Um, I love history and things like that. It was very well done. Thank you, Nell. Thank you. All right. And Susan? I don't have a question either, either, either. Thank you very much for that great uh, presentation. But it also happened after that with the cannabis industry. So that the, the guy that was hired for prohibition that ran the government program, they moved him through uh, that Mellon guy was the treasurer, I think. Anslinger was his name. And he then regulated cannabis out of existence, out of people's consciousness. and. At the time, it was the second most prescribed medicine. So that movement sort of uh, got rid of all our natural medicines. And we also, so some of that information applies to Bella Vida in a way, because when they removed cannabis, which was the second most prescribed remedy in the 30s by doctors, it sort of, it, they, they badmouthed the medical chemical industry, badmouthed natural medicines. And like, I think Bella Vida is, huh? You've got a page to write. <laughs> I, I could write for hours on this. All right. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, Susan. Jenny. Hi. Um, I, okay, I have a documentary that I don't remember the name of. I, unfortunately, I think it's my ADHD. I remember general details rather than specific details. But when I was going to college just a few semesters ago, um, there was this documentary that, that they made us watch about the gas industry, like automobile gas. And that's the original reason for prohibition, in case you guys didn't know, was uh, Rockefeller wanted fuel to be used in vehicles. And Henry Ford originally was using alcohol as gas. And that's the whole reason prohibition started was not anything to do with drinking alcohol. It was like collateral damage. It was a shocking documentary. It has like a one word title. I can't remember the name of it, but it was crazy. Rockefeller destroyed like half of this country. Rockefeller destroyed a lot. Rockefeller yeah. and evil. Yeah, he was the reason that, that prohibition started. You know, I'm sorry to say, but it's like he was trying to destroy Ford, not the alcohol industry. You know what I mean? So I don't know. In case yeah. you guys didn't know that, I wanted to know if anybody knew that. That's, That's awesome. my question. So yeah, you know, there's, you can, this is where the, you know, we, why we have wine as our number one anchor here, bringing it all back to wine. We're on the wine investment. There's so many different ways, different tangents you guys can go with your marketing campaigns. You can take it for new pages for those of you that have your PBS, you know, just expand and dream a little bit and have fun with it and you know utilize the tools we've inter been introducing you guys to like canva and tiktok don't be afraid of it um you know Stacey, don't be afraid of facebook either yes stacy i will um say one thing though um the first time that i applied for google adsense um their comment was that i should change uh, the name of my website to something to do with wine because I my my website was all about wine. I had too many wine pages on my website. So if you haven't gotten Google AdSense yet, kind of um, you know don't don't do a lot of pages about. I had like forty different pages on wine, <laughs> and I had to take a lot of those off to get Google AdSense. So just 
And yeah. the other thing is, I know we were talking about the Tommy gun and everything. You don't want to use that on your pages because no. it won't go for mm -mm. for Google either. No. <laughs> I was thinking about your TikTok, Stacey. I was I was sitting over here threading. They're gonna shut you down. <laughs> <laughs> What they post on TikTok, doubtful. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've seen some of them. <laughs> All right. We've got just a couple more questions. Go ahead, Vicki. Okay. Uh, is Nell's presentation going to be available to us? I missed some of it because I got kicked out for a while. Um, well, it's, um, I, yeah, I, if I can figure out how to do that. <laughs> okay. I'd appreciate that. It was very okay. good, Nell. Oh, thank interesting. you. Very thank interesting. You. Thank you. And Kathy. <laughs> there you got it. There we go. I can be taught. Uh, thank you, Mel. That was that was wonderful. I love history. And um, I just wanted to say real quick, Jenny, it's called Pump. The documentary that you're talking about is called Pump. Huh? Um, <laughs> All right. I'm a big prohibition history buff. So there you go. Right. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Now it was, that was such for, especially for people who are history, you can write about anything that happened in history. And, but to keep it on the, the wine aspect, um, you know, we, we get to do things that our grandparents and great grandparents didn't get to do with the wine. And that's just plain old taste it mm -hmm. and enjoy it. And you can use that going forward with how you present things. When you're just talking to people to talk about the wine, Nell's giving you guys some great background when people come at you going, well, you know, because of prohibition, we don't do, you know, hey, now you've heard about it. We're going to help Nell get that presentation shared to the rest of us. And, um, you know, you'll be able to have better posture <laughs> when, when you're hit with some of those objections getting hit with objections that that's what I really am liking about why Nell chose to teach us about prohibition is because there's been generations that it's well that's just how it was done okay if we said that on a lot of stuff that's just how it was done we wouldn't be here we wouldn't be on zoom you know I found out just this over the last couple of weeks that I think I knew about it, but it, I, it, I got reminded of when my family went back to the old family farm and my uncle, who is child number three out of 10, remembers helping install electricity onto the farm. And they were the first place in a 15 mile radius to get electricity. And that was the 1930s. And they got the electricity because a tornado came through and took out the barn and the insurance company didn't want to replace the barn, but they were willing to give money to help put in electricity. That was kind of crazy. Um, but, you know, we wouldn't have all this. So we need to embrace all the different things that we've got here and just open our minds and open our creative veins that have been untapped. I know, pun I'm not going to apologize for it. It was a good pun. <laughs> um, I don't have one for bunghole. I'm sorry. Um, we know that, the, you know, the, the plug. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, we can just go out and have some fun. And when you're having fun with what we've got here with Wine Ambassador, people are going to take notice. They're going to stalk you. And then someday they're going to ask you a question, whether it be by email, instant message on Facebook, how, in, fate, in front of you, in the store, or whatever. They're going to ask you, especially since we're all doing it together. 
they're going to have this, the likelihood of them seeing it from somebody else they don't know is just going to edify you to your friends and family because they're going to see it from somebody else. But your friends and family aren't going to know about it unless you speak about it. So consider our wine ambassador opportunity, the new speakeasy. You know what came to mind? What's you that? know how Rory always says fish? Teach a person mm -hmm. to fish. Mm -hmm. Mel just fished for you. Oh, big she big. just went out and found out all this information to help you write pages, um, know more knowledge, get more knowledge. It was huge. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Always now. <laughs> Course. Yeah, that was great. What um, the whole that was a lot of information, and I'm, my mind's kind of blown right now. So yes, I would like to be in line to get some of that information. But what I wanted to say was to tie it back into like you want to write pages, but you can also use some of this information for like. TikTok videos. And you can be the person that has like all of that stuff was like little known information. I didn't know doctors were writing prescriptions for alcohol back then. Like that just kind of that one little tidbit just blew my mind. So you can use that for these little 60 second videos or 15 second videos and maybe make your presentation on camp or make a picture on Canva and use that as the background. That Canva will be a good way to incorporate maybe some gangster stuff with wine bottles and all of that stuff so anyway that's why i just wanted to encourage everybody oh and batch recording on tiktok because you can have as many drafts as you want you can make one video and draft it make another video and draft it like you can make as many videos as you want and draft them and then release them whenever you feel like releasing them like okay. three a day two a day you're, you know what i'm talking about you could spend an entire day doing dozens of TikToks and mm -hmm. not have to make another TikTok and just sit there and hit post. Right. 30 seconds to get a new TikTok out on there. Right. Hmm. Hmm. Kind of like doing templates for posting ads. Mm -hmm. You get the template made and you can just post ads that much quicker. Hmm. It's almost like we have a system here, guys. Just saying. <laughs> All right. Anything else, Linda and Nell? Nope. I'm going to tell you that DeCourcy, his handle is Decoy Williams on TikTok. Decoy. I just friended him. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm already friends with him. Yeah, he followed, he, he popped up in my feed and I went, hello. <laughs> <laughs> So then that, that's the nice thing with TikTok is when you follow someone, you don't have to wait for their approval. So those of us that have TikToks, I don't have to have a big lineup like Facebook to sit and hit approve or accept. Um, I'm going to stop the recording.